work was done together with Florian Meyer and Heng Tong Ving. And in the second study, we somehow joined forces with the perturbative experts, Nicolaina and Jacobo Calieri, to also um, give lattice constraints on the thermal photon rates. So some words about the motivation of these studies. So one, one of the motivations <coughs> Uh, is to understand the low mass enhancement in, seen in the dilaton rates, for instance, at star at, at Rick, at uh, Star and Phoenix, and to understand what contributions to these dilaton rates could come from the QGP side. And to do so, we need to understand the vector spectral function. So that we want to calculate from, from lattice QCD correlation functions, because that is then directly related to the dilaton rates to this formula here. So once, once we know this vector spectral function from QCD, we have the full QCD information in there, and then we, this here is a leading order in, the, in, in QED. The second motivation is to understand the same for photons, and there might be a window for photon rates coming from heavy ion experiments, a window where we might be sensitive to the thermal photons coming from the QGP, here also we need the, the vector spectral function, but here at finite momentum, okay? And then we directly get the photon rates. And the third motivation is to get information about transport properties. In this case, the electrical conductivity, so the light quark diffusion coefficient. But here as an example, I, I show you how, how important it is to, to get transport coefficients from lattice QCD calculations, because they are usually used as, as input into um, models that describe the evolution of the, of the QGP or of, a, of the medium produced in heavy ion collisions. And for instance, here for the heavy flavor case, um, people use some numbers for, for the heavy quark diffusion coefficient, plug, plug it into their models, and then try to, to describe, for instance, the heavy flavor RAA or the heavy flavor V2. But of course, it would be very important to understand these transport coefficients or calculate these transport coefficients directly from QCD from first principle QCD calculations. So what is the problem? So the problem is we want to extract spectral functions, but all we can calculate on the lattice are correlation functions. So we can ca calculate these correlation functions, and then we need to invert this integral equation here to get the, get the spectral function. And this, this inversion of this integral here is already a very complicated problem. What is more complicated is also that the spectral function has a lot of contributions from different scales entering. So for instance, at large energies, there is a continuum. There may be possible bound states at intermediate frequencies. Um, then there is at low omega, there is a transport peak. So this here contains the transport coefficient in the limit omega to zero through a Kubo formula. So it's really notoriously difficult to extract from the correlation functions measured out on the lattice, this spectral function here. And I will show you results where we try to do this. We still have large systematic uncertainties in there, but what we use is we use an ansatz or different ansatz for the spectral function and then fit the correlation function calculated on the lattice. And another problem that we also face there is that there are, in addition to this complex structure of the spectral function, there are also cutoff effects in the game here. And we want to get, get rid of all these cutoff effects by performing the continuum extrapolation of the correlation function and then extract really the continuum spectral function from the team. <coughs> what do we know about the spectral function? Um, so in the free case, the spectral function can be calculated analytically. So this here is now for the vector spectral function. There we have this omega squared behavior at large frequencies. And we have a so-called zero mode contrib contribution, a delta function in the spectral function at the origin, which then in the correlator gives a constant contribution in the correlation function. When we now switch on interactions, uh, this changes a bit, so one can look into the leading order perturbative behavior, then you get a different constant here in front of the omega squared, and this um, delta function, at least in the spatial part of the, of the spectral function, gets smeared out and becomes a transport peak, and then you can read off the electrical conductivity if you are uh, using light quarks here. So these are the lattices that we used. Um, to calculate, first to calculate the vector correlation functions and then also to perform the continuum extrapolation. We used quenched <coughs> gauge configurations. Um, you see how large the lattices get. So the largest one is 192 cubed 64. So even with the best computers available now, this is only possible at the moment in the quenched approximation. Then for the valence quarks, so for the calculating the correlation function, we used 
um, Clover improved Wilson fermions. And whenever we need, we need use a non perturbative free normalization constants. And the quark masses in these studies here are close to the chiral limit, so they are uh, small at least compared to the temperature. Um, right, for, so we analyzed three different temperatures. For two of these temperatures, for 1.1 Tc and 1.3 Tc, we had a fixed aspect ratio. So for these temperatures, we could also perform the continuum extrapolation at the end at finite momentum because there you need this fixed aspect ratio. <coughs> so this is a typical correlation function. For the finest lattices for the three different temperatures, it's compared to the free correlation function. So on this scale here, you don't see much of a difference. That's why we usually calculate ratios of our lattice data compared to this free correlation function here. And the result you see here for three different lattices at 1.1 Tc. And then we perform at, a at fixed distances, we perform the continuum extrapolation. So the extrapolation of nt to infinity or 1 over nt squared to 0, and then get the continuum extrapolated correlation function. And the result for this continuum extrapolated correlation function you see here is a band in this figure here. So it uh, is very similar to the finest lattice at large separations, but it's obvious that for all separations, and especially for small separations, you really need to perform this continuum extrapolation. And then we did for, well, that's the same figure that we did for all the three temperatures. This is 1.1 Tc, this is 1.3 Tc, and this is 1.5 Tc. And here you see a comparison of the continuum extrapolated correlators normalized by this free correlation function for all the three temperatures and also compared to the free correlation function here. So uh, we see a very similar behavior in this temperature regime. So that already indicates that um, there is a weak temperature dependence on the electrical conductivity and on the dilaton rates, at least if you scale it correctly with the temperature. Okay. And the uh, non-perturbative information that we want to extract from this, that's just the difference here between the free and the lattice continuum extrapolated current. So this difference is relatively small, so you, here you already see how hard it is to extract the spectral information out of this. Um, <coughs> yeah, what, what we then did is we we used a simple ansatz for the spectral function. So that contains this transport peak, this by Wigner at the origin, and the leading order perturbative correction here for this omega square behavior, where in principle, of course, you have to uh, include a running coupling in this kappa, but we, uh, for the moment, we just keep this here as a constant. Okay. Then we plug in this ansatz into this, this integral formula, convoluted with a kernel, and then fit the continuum extrapolated correlation function with a simple ansatz. And it was very surprising that the simple ansatz already fits the data very well over the whole distance region here. And the chi squared over degrees of freedom is also around one, which shows that this fit already works very well. <coughs> but then um, that was not all. Uh, we wanted to understand now the systematic uncertainties in this ansatz. So we changed this ansatz a bit and we um, somehow cut the large omega part, the continuum part of this correlation function by a smeared step function. And also this, um, by, ch by, by changing the smearing here, that also describes the data very well or can, can be fitted to the data very well. And that gives then a second band here. So the simple ansatz was, was this this band here and the light green one here is the ansatz where we cut the large omega. So it has a bit less contribution here in this part and a bit larger contribution here in the limit omega to zero. So somehow it gives a larger uh, electrical conductivity in this case. Okay. Then the next question was, can also a very, very flat um, behavior on the, of the spectral function can also describe our data? So we don't have a real transport peak, peak, but a rather smooth limit omega to zero. So we use a different ansatz or change the, the ansatz a bit to, to also have a flat behavior at small frequency. And also this can describe the data well within with a chi squared of order of one. Okay. <coughs> then the next question was, 
do we really have a transport peak here? So do we have a finite electrical conductivity? Or can also um, an infinite electrical conductivity, so a delta function in the, in the spectral function, describe our data? And, but that, in principle, we could rule out. So here you see two different, different fits. On the left, we include the full covariance matrix. And on the right, we did just a, use just the diagonal covariance matrix. And both fits um, do not work that well. And also, the chi-squared comes out larger than before. So it seems that we get a finer, finite upper limit for the electrical conductivity for other ansatz uh, and could rule out this, this, uh, this delta function here. And we get also a non-zero lower limit in principle from this flat behavior of the spectrum. And we wanted to do even a bit better. So as I said, this um, omega squared part here, that was a leading order perturbative part. And uh, the question was, can we do better there and include more information on, from the perturbative side and also include uh, the effect of a running coupling? And there we looked into the vacuum um, perturbative spectral functions. So if you go to very high energies, at some point the, the, the temperature shouldn't shouldn't matter, you, you come into the asymptotic freedom and everything should be vacuum-like. So there the spectral function is known up to five loop order. And then one can also use, it depends here on alpha s. And then you can also plug in a running of the coupling there. There we use the three loop running, uh, but we also tried four loop, and I think also five loop, well, five loop, four loop. Uh, but we don't see much of a difference, so that's why we took a three loop running of the coupling. Um, the effect of the correlator on this, of this perturbative correlator you see here. Um, so there is some small effect still if you go from leading order to, to this five loop running, but then it somehow seems to, seems to converge. At least at small separations, of course at larger separations, then you go to, to smaller energies in the spectral function, and then also perturbation theory shouldn't work anymore. So then we use this um, perturbative information in the large omega part. And well, first we compared, or not we, but Janis Bernier and Nicolaine compared to some of our old data. And there you see that at small separations, uh, it seems to fit the data, the, the lattice data already quite well. But then you have the non-perturbative effects at larger separations. And that is what we really wanted to understand using our continuum extrapolated data and using fits. And that's why we then included the perturbative spectral function here, corrected it with the, with the temperature, correct temperature dependence in the spectral function, and did the same fits at, as before. And what you see then that this ansatz then also describes the data very well within a chi-square of order of, of one. So these are all three spectral functions that describe our data very well within this uh, or with this uh, chi-squared of order of one. So there you see what the problem is. Um, the correlation function is not very sensitive to this, very, to this small omega behavior in the spectral function. Uh, but what we get here are somehow lower limits and upper limits for the electrical conductivity here, and some results for the spectral function in this region here, at least within an error. And then the other, these are the results for the electrical conductivity. So the lower band comes from this flat the <coughs> spectral function and the upper limit from the extreme case that we get. And well, the systematic errors are still relatively large, but within these systematic uncertainties, we, we don't see much of a temperature dependence on this electrical conductivity. <coughs> there are other studies not using continuum extrapolated correlation functions, but finite lattices. But there are also some studies using full QCD, and Anthony Francis has a poster um, where some of these results are, are compared. And well, now you have the spectral function, and then you can plug it into this formula, and then also calculate the dilepton rates, and the comparison you see here. So there's also much of not much temperature dependence here in the dilepton rate. Uh, if you compare to the HDL calculation, then it has a better behavior at small frequencies because the HDL is not reliable in that region. And if you go to high energies, then you approach the Born rate, which, which one should do. <coughs> Sorry. So going to, uh, to the photons, so now we are interested in the vector spectral function at finite momentum. 
to then extract the photon rays. Um, but first, some words about the perturbative knowledge about the ve of the vector spectral function. Um, that goes back uh, many decades, so the leading order was, was known in these years. But um, there are different perturbative calculations depending in, on which scale you are, uh, what uh, invariant masses you are looking on in. And, or if you go to high energies, then you can use vacuum perturbation theory and then can go to very high order. I don't want to go into the details here, but um, to use this to, to, to compare to lattice calculations, one needs to, to interpolate somehow between perturbative, different perturbative calculations or different scales. And uh, in addition, one needs to know about the momentum dependence of the spectral function in the low omega region. Their perturbation theory doesn't help, but hydrodynamics helps. So the vector spectral function in the hydrodynamic regime looks like this. So there the quark number susceptibility enters, the diffusion coefficient enters, while this uh, diffusion coefficient is also related to the electrical conductivity here. And already if you have the electrical conductivity, you can also calculate the soft photon rate which then becomes this formula here, so it's directly related to the electrical conductivity. Um, another calculation that also helps a bit is uh, an ads tft framework, where you also cal can calculate the vector spectral function. And at least in the limit of small omega and small k, it has the, the same structure as, as the hydrodynamic case, uh, also with the quark number susceptibility, which can be calculated exactly, and also the diffusion coefficient. And if you are going close to the hydrodynamic limit, then this form is, is similar to the, to the hydrodynamic case. But one can still learn something from the ads dft calculation, at least about the structure of the spectral function, also beyond the hydrodynamic limit, although, of course, this is not QCD. Um, but here are some of the, of the perturbative calculations. I don't want to go much into the details. Um, it was improved a lot in the last last years by also including um, LPM calculations. Um, there one has to be a bit careful because the LPM calculation also includes the, the standard uh, HDL calculation, so there's some kind of double counting which one has to care about. And then you have to interpolate between the different scales, and that was done um, by, by Nikolaine and, and company, and somehow the best perturbative spectral function at the moment is shown, is shown here, as the dashed curves. curves. Um, so that's already an interpolation now between these different perturbative calculations, and that we use then to compare to our lattice calculation. Um, in the small omega part, we want to, to, be, to keep the spectral function somehow somehow uh, a, bit, a bit free, and we use the polynomial ansatz at small omega and then smoothly match this to the perturbative at larger omega. The matching point was this point here, so, so at, uh, at frequencies somehow larger by pi t squared compared to the, to the momentum, we did this matching of this polynomial to the perturbative calculations. And then we fitted this polynomial to our continuum extrapolated lattice data. And the results, some, some results you see here. So this year is at 1.1 TC for three different momenta. The dot, dots are the continuum extrapolated lattice correlation functions. The red curve or red dashed line here, that's the best estimate from, from PQCD. And then the blue lines are the fits using our polynomial ansatz at small energies. And you see that the perturbation theory already describes the data quite well at small separations. And it gets increasingly better if you go to larger momenta. But you need some additional contribution here to really describe the data over the full distance range. On the right, you see then the spectral functions. So what we are interested in here it's just, in principle, just one point here because that's the photon point where we can then extract the, the photon rate. Okay. And there you see that, well, the uncertainties are still a bit large, and, but it's really important to get these non-perturbative effects here, which then 
uh, reduced compared to this perturbative estimate. That's the same for 1.3 TC. And this here is now the final result for our photon rates. What we plot here is some effective diffusion coefficient, which depends on, on momentum, <coughs> which then in the limit of uh, k to 0 gives the, the electrical conductivity. But this d effective of k is directly, directly related to the, to the photon rate. Okay? And the results from our, from our fit to the continuum lattice data, that are the points here, with still rather large errors. And this is compared to the NLO prediction from PQCD, which is the band here. And what you see here that somehow this, the photon rates become more and more perturbative if you go to larger momenta. So at least uh, the largest momentum that we have on the lattice already is somehow consistent with the perturbative behavior here at a momentum of uh, order six times the temperature. While at small momenta, we, we have here the, the small lattice result. The perturbative result, well, this calculation here would go to infinity, so that's not reliable at small momenta. But also the perturbative result, a different perturbative result on the electrical conductivity would be somehow some flaws above here. And if you want to compare to ADS CFT, the result is shown here. So here it's really important to have to include the non-perturbative effect using using lattice QCD correlation functions. But what's somehow <coughs> more important here or more interesting for, for future studies in this direction is that um, if you would have more data here for small momenta and also more accurate data for small momenta, it would be nice to um, extrapolate these results at finite momentum to zero momentum and then extract it this way the transport coefficient. Um, but for that, of course, we need more momenta in this region, small momentum region here, which means either larger lattices or different boundary conditions. And of course, the errors have to be smaller than we have now. That uh, brings me almost to the conclusions. Here is just the same analysis, so using more perturbative information and this polynomial ansatz for small omega, also in the case of zero momentum. There it's much more complicated, so there also the uncertainties are much larger here on this transport peak. That's also why I think it's very important to go to finite momentum if you want to extract transport coefficient and then perform the, continu uh, the limit k to zero in a, in a clever way. And that brings me to the conclusions. So using continuum extrapolated correlation func functions and using, well, perturbatively and also phenomenologically inspired ansets, uh, we were able to extract uh, transport properties and also spectral properties from lattice QCD data. Uh, I've shown results on the electrical conductivity of flavor diffusion coefficient and results for the dilaton rates and thermal photon ra rates. And those results should now, of course, also be included in, in hydro models or other models that describe the, the, the medium produced in heavy ion experiments and then to, to understand what thermal contributions really come uh, from the QGP. If you are interested in that, you can find all parameters in our paper and also the PQCD spectral functions, so these interpolated spectral functions on a web page by Nicolina. And of course, in the future, it would be nice to go away from the quench approximation here. Um, that would need, of course, a lot of computing powers. Uh, but at some point, at least if you go to closer to the critical temperature, this will become, of course, very important as fermionic degrees of freedom there should play a role. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for perhaps one or two short questions. Yes, we need. <laughs> I didn't understand your, your second to last slide, I think, where you show the ADS CFT point right here. Yep. So the ADS CFT point is, is constant as a function of k over t, right? It's always 1 over 2 pi. Well, that's right. That's, well, that's the result for the diffusion coefficient, which is anyhow only uh, at zero momentum. But, but also the, I mean, the, the D of K, I don't know if that is... 
Yeah, I guess that should also be constant in ADS CFD. But what I wanted to compare here is just the, the limit k to zero for the, which gives you the electrical conductivity. And that's the result here for ADS CFT. And the perturbative result, if you include some, some lattice result for the, for the quark number susceptibility, then the perturbative, leading order perturbative result would be at three. Okay, so and the lattice result for the conductivity is uh, shown here. That are our lattice results. But you, you couldn't conclude from that that your lattice results are in agreement with ads CFT no. from K over T two and larger or louder, so. No, no. 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 There we just compare to perturbative calculation. Um, and also at, at zero momentum, so for the electrical conductivity, I wouldn't say that it's closer to ads CFT or closer to perturbative at the moment. Um, well, the perturbative calculation, if you go to NLO, then you see a large correction here, and you don't know if what happens at even higher orders. I think at the moment I wouldn't conclude that we are close to here. It's just as it is. I think. Uh, yeah, is it a brief question? It's a comment on that. Comment. So uh, I think it is close to to ADS CFT because we've computed the. Uh, if you compute the diffusion coefficient at zero temperature by computing the conductivity divided by susceptibility, you get a number of the order of one over two pi t. So I would, and it's not a number which is large. So yeah, it's not it's not large compared to ADS CFT. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have to uh, move on. So thank you. Very much. Our, our next speaker will be Atsuro Ikeda yeah. on tram, quark diffusion, and relaxation time from lattice, in French lattice relations, right? Yeah.